Thank you so much for joining the Career Meets World podcast, Kara. It is such a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks for having me. Super fun. Of course. I know we've been planning this for a while now, and I'm glad we're finally having the wheels in motion. And I really want to jump in and ask you a specific question really related to everything you've done in entrepreneurship, because you often call yourself an accidental entrepreneur and not necessarily somebody who wanted to go down that pathway. Can you share with us a little bit about how you stumbled into this journey? Yeah, you know, I won't even go as far as to say I didn't want to. It's just I never thought about it, right? I I went to school thinking that I was going to be a journalist, and that's where I started. And then as I was, uh, I started actually at Time Magazine and, and then ended up getting recruited out of there, which would be uh, to a company that would be thought of today, I think, as a late stage startup. It's called CNN. And so Ted Turner was still running around the office in, in New York. And I mean, I probably learned the most about culture going from time, which was super buttoned up to, you know, a little bit crazy and guys running around in a suit and cowboy boots. I, I grew up in Arizona. I hadn't even seen that in Arizona. It was just, it was just funny. I mean, it just to me, like watching those different kind of cultures. Um, and then when I moved to Silicon Valley, shortly after that, uh, I was engaged and came out with my husband. We we actually wanted to stay in New York and nobody it was uh, basically technology law was all happening in the Bay Area in 1994. And so we came out thinking we'll be here for two years and then go back once it starts back in New York and some of the firms. And, um, and uh, it, but so it was really because of him that we came out. And then I was considering, do I stay with CNN uh, or do I go and do something else? And I had an original iMac when I was in college. I was a journalism major. I got so tired of putting white out into the keys on my typewriter. And uh, so I used all my pennies from waitressing to buy an iMac. And I was obsessed with Steve Jobs. I, I just loved, you know, the design of it, the you know, the aesthetics of it, but also it worked and it was simple and I didn't know how it worked, but it worked. And I loved that whole thinking. So I was trying to figure out how do I get a job at Apple when I moved out here? And then I thought, eh, it's kind of far from San Francisco. Um, it's, you know, way down in Silicon Valley. And then I also didn't, I wasn't an engineer. So I, I doubted whether or not I could actually get a job there, but I'd run across this little startup that had started um, inside of Apple, actually, that was doing CD-ROM shopping. And I thought, well, I love to shop. And I don't know, maybe just for kicks, because I have nothing else going on. I don't know anyone in San Francisco. I'll just cold call. And it ended up that they picked up the phone. And it was five guys in an office. It was like the, you know, it was so different than what I had seen in New York. And I remember, you know, going to lunch with these guys and thinking, I don't really even know what happened, but the environment is so different. But in addition, this entrepreneurial spirit of, they kept asking me what my opinion was on stuff. It wasn't about where I went to school, what my title was. They wanted to know whether or not I could contribute. And which I had never really been in that type of environment. It was so opposite from what I had experienced already. And uh, anyway, they ended up offering me a job. Uh, I kept thinking they're going to find me out eventually that they should never have offered me a job, but it'll be fun while it lasts. And one of our investors, a couple of years later, um, America Online ended up acquiring us and uh, asked me to run this division. I was the youngest vice president at America Online, was uh, one of the few females at that level. And uh, shopping and e-commerce was never supposed to happen. I mean, there's crazy stories, including uh, some of them I talk about in the book, others, you know, reaching out to Jeff Bezos when he was just a bookstore, you know, and building bookshelves with him. I mean, it was just, it was insane what we were experiencing and just kind of that entrepreneurial spirit, but didn't know it back then. And so when I, I left AOL after seven years, uh, primarily because I didn't want to travel anymore. I had young kids, I had three and four in San Francisco. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to find something else. Uh, my husband at this point was inside of Netscape. And I thought, I'm going to do something, you know, 
probably in tech because that's where all my experience is and that's how people defined me. I defined myself that way. But where my curiosity was really going, and frankly, I think it's it's kind of started because of my kids and trying to figure out what the heck I'm putting in their body. Um, because parenting to me was this, you know, huge unknown. And uh and I, I didn't want to make a mistake, right? I, I wanted to make sure I was doing every, had the right diapers and, you know, the right stroller and the right food. Um, but I think for me, it was when I started looking at my own health and I had been drinking diet soda, diet Coke in particular for years. And that's when kind of the same things that I had really learned from these startup environments around uh, being curious, um, what kind of, like, what, how do we solve this problem? Maybe it's cause I wasn't working. I started doing it in my own life. And, uh, I, I ended up giving up the diet soda just as a test and started drinking plain water. And I sliced up fruit one day. I think I looked around to make sure no one was looking. Cause I think I really thought I was kind of cheating and that wasn't really what I was supposed to do, but plain water was so boring for me. So I, threw it in the water. And then I thought, this makes water good, finally. And uh, two and a half weeks after just changing out the Diet Coke for this water concoction that I had made in my kitchen, I lost 24 pounds. My skin cleared up, my energy levels were back. And uh, that's when I just thought, huh, like, why isn't this product on the shelf? And again, like, I didn't realize that I was going to be an entrepreneur. I didn't even realize that I was starting a company. I was instead just trying to really take the steps to figure out the why. And, and so today, I mean, we talk, you know, figure out your why, a mission-based company, none of that 16 years ago was really talked about yet. I think it's a practice so often in Silicon Valley that, from an industry standpoint, they've done a better job of really living that than maybe some other industries. So that was really kind of the, the kind of the impetus to, to actually go in and try and get a product on the shelf and, and whole foods and uh, yeah, and hint began. And you did it. And it's such a beautiful story and the way you tell it for everything that you learn, everything you experienced, right? I think the consistent theme across the board from time to CNN to getting acquired by AOL and now with Hint is just genuine curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes when we see people going through their career, we oftentimes see people wanting to slot into a role or into a company and fit in with the culture what do you think it is about yourself that made you consistently inquisitive about life for things in general? Well, I think when, when I think about even the, the startup called Two Market that I was in, we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, I've had so many people reach out to me who were living the 90s, right? On, uh, you know, I mean, it was just, there were so many doubters out there saying e-commerce is never going to happen. And and, you know, you just, I don't know, you just kind of flew the plane as you were building it and had a good time. And, you know, you started to see progress. So you took one step forward, but then five steps backwards. And, and so I think, if, I, I think for me, it was, it was being allowed. I feel very grateful to have experienced that because I felt like if you don't actually have the roadmap, that's where you learn the most, where that's where you're you're curious about things. You wake up every single day and try and find those wins, definitely. But you know that you're going to have some losses along the way and that things aren't going to go. But you live this life of both of those things happening constantly and you become more resilient, right? You become um, just more zen to some extent because you're just like, eh, it doesn't happen. People have said to me, gosh, you, especially in the book, I mean, you own a lot of your challenges that came up and I'm, and you know, it's just, I, I find it strange that people don't talk about their challenges because it's almost like 
therapy to me to actually say, okay, here's what happened. Here's my perspective on, on what happened. And then what I've learned to do along the way too, is, is think about what could I have done differently? And that's a question that I always share with people that don't sit there and be a blamer or right. Instead own it and think about, you know, the, the process of like, if, if it would have been this way, or maybe if that technology would have been out there or whatever, that is how you grow and you learn. And so, I mean, I think it was just, I, I just, I, I think it was really the experiences and allowing myself to kind of, you know, not, not be afraid to really not know, not have all the answers. And yet many of my friends, even from CNN, CNN was getting bigger. People were like, what is she doing in Silicon Valley? I mean, she could do a lot of other things. And why is she doing what she was doing? I think it really boils down to allowing myself to go into a place where I was going to learn. And I kept thinking, and I still talk a lot about this today that, you know, people say, oh, like you must be risk adverse. No, I actually lead with learning. I mean, that's where I, I'm constantly trying to learn. And when you think about when you learn, when you're learning along the way, it is risky, especially in other people's eyes. But yet I always believed, and I still believe that I could go back to what I was doing where I was successful. And I think that that is, that's sometimes something that people need to be reminded about, right? Yeah, that I, absolutely. right. I mean, you know, in your experience, right. You've got, you know, you've got an engineering degree, you've had great experiences. I'm sure many people said, what are you doing? I mean, why, what, like, right. But you could always go back yet. That is not a natural people think that they have to just move forward and they can't go back. And that's where I always challenge people that first of all, a lot of your learnings come from your own journey along the way. But in addition, I've interviewed people, some of my best interviews that I've had with people and hired people are those people that can actually own their journey, talk about their failures. Maybe they veered off right and they didn't turn left soon enough. They're not going to make those mistakes again, right? That that is there. I, I think it's really, really important for people to remind themselves about that. There's always going to be bumps along the road. And that's something we need to acknowledge, but not necessarily something that people want to own all the time, like you said. And I think again, what I'm hearing and kind of seeing from your journey and story is. I often say that the quality of our life is predicated on the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think for you, you constantly ask yourself, how do I get better? How do I improve this? How do I tweak that? And that's seen throughout your successes in your career. And in the spirit of asking questions, I have to ask in your early days, you mentioned when you're working kind of in the e-commerce space, you had an opportunity to kind of work with Jeff Bezos. I'm curious if you can expand on that experience and what you learned from that moment. I didn't work that closely with Jeff Bezos. I uh, actually, it happened when I was, in, when we were at AOL and we're building out a marketplace. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, you have to understand that there were, there were like a few retailers on AOL and then they acquired our little company to market. And we had relationships with LL Bean and J. Crew and The Gap. And we were really kind of teaching many, many big retail names, how to go online. And AOL was a proprietary service. And so it was, you know, faster, it was more graphically interesting. It was exactly what the consumer wanted in terms of, um, you know, the early days uh, of the internet. And so it was, uh, it was when I started to look at, I, I studied malls. I mean, here's another thing. Here's a journalist. Here, you know, I knew how to research thing, but I've studied mall development and uh, and you know everything from the Fourth Street in Berkeley, trying to understand how do people think about going into the, those streets or you know the Simon Malls or Westfield or whatever. I would really, really study and understand this. So I started to see that there were 
consistencies among anchors and that if you had uh, Nordstrom's, maybe you weren't going to have a Sears. If you had them, they were on other ends of the spectrum. And how could I mimic those things? Again, I didn't have the roadmap. No one was doing what I was trying to do. And so, you know, I was trying. I was just making it up as I went along. I didn't know. People were like, how did you know to do that? I'm like, I don't know, but it's, it kind of works. Like I went in and spoke the language when I would go into these retailers um, about what they knew. And they say, yeah, that's true. Oh, J. Crew's in there. You know, then the gap needs to be in there, whatever. So I didn't have a bookseller on a, for AOL. And I thought everybody wants books. And they kept requesting that they really wanted books. And we were trying to work with Barnes & Noble. Again, at the time, the graphics were, were really pretty slow on the regular internet. And uh, there was this other company called Borders and they had both said no to us. And so I'd heard about this guy up in Seattle that had launched this bookstore. And it was, uh, it was, you know, tiny, still really bare bones. This is 1996. And so I reach out to Jeff and I said, Hey, I'm at AOL. You know, we'd really love to, you know, come up and, and talk to you. I was actually thinking that I want to talk to him, but I don't really, this probably isn't going to be the, we're, we're going to get Barnes and Noble and Borders, but it's just worth a Southwest f flight from San Francisco up there. So he, I, I remember distinctly, he said, I can't actually meet with you until five o'clock because I have a lot of work to do during the day. And I was like, fine, I'll, I'll land there at 445, whatever. So he said, here's my address. So I pull into this area, it's a bunch of warehouses. And I'm driving around, driving around and with another colleague uh, that I brought with me and couldn't find any addresses. So finally it's 5.15, I'm supposed to be there at five. I call him and I said, he picks up the phone and he, and he said, uh, you're late. And I said, I know I'm here, but I can't find any addresses. So he comes out of the building. Imagine this, Jeff Bezos, like coming out of the building. And, um, he, and I said, okay, great. And then I look around, I'm like, Jeff, there's no uh, numbers on the building. And he said, oh, I just figured you'd find it. Okay. So uh, he said, but, you know, I can't really meet with you actually because it's, uh, it's 530. And I said that we were meeting at five o'clock. And, uh, and I said, oh, uh, he said, I, I have to build a bunch of bookshelves. And I said, I know how to build bookshelves. I had never built a bookshelf before, but I said, I can do this. He had a bunch of these, you know, the tube things from Home Depot that you're punching together. And I, uh, and he said, really? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a great bookshelf. You know, I can do it. And he said, and I said, we'll talk while we're building bookshelves. He said, okay. He just wanted help, right? Building the bookshelves. He said, I have this huge delivery coming tomorrow. So we're building bookshelves and I'll never forget actually the meeting, um, what transpired. I'm, I'm really trying to size them up for, uh, you know, trying to figure out, is there any possible way that I can launch with this, you know, tiny, tiny unknown bookseller? And I said, so why do you think that you'll be successful against Barnes and Noble or Borders? And he said, let me ask you a question. Do you read a lot? And I said, I do read a lot. And he said, do you ever go into a bookstore and ask the guy behind the counter for a recommendation? And I said, I do. And he said, do you trust the recommendation? And I'm like, well, he can't possibly know all the different categories of books. And he said, the future of book selling is recommendation and search. This is before Google. This is 1996. And oh. I was looking at him just thinking, huh. And I, I'll never forget. I, I left and I thought, I don't know if Amazon's going to make it or not, but this guy is freaking smart. Like on, right. Like he, it was just the, the, what he was talking about was exactly, he was ahead of where everyone else was. Barnes and Noble and Borders were not talking about 
they weren't talking about search. They were, I mean, they just thought, oh, the technology isn't there. I mean, he was really thinking about it and he was scrappy enough that he was building bookshelves, right? And trying to make it happen. And I remember getting on the plane and uh, just thinking, you know, I don't know. I, I think he's going to figure this out. And because he's just, you, you can just tell there was this spark there. What I think is so interesting, I, I was sharing with somebody when I was sharing the story the other day is that that's 1996, right? Rec uh, obviously, Google came along and really like jumped in on, on this whole search phase. But I mean, things always take longer, right? Than you anticipate. I mean, recommendations... I mean, arguably five years ago, it really was, I mean, it took 20 years, right? To, to really kind of get to where it needed to be. And that was with a lot of money behind it. It was just, but the, the ability for the consumer to adapt to what oftentimes early entrepreneurs, especially when you're talking about something new, it's just, it, it just takes time and it's really hard to predict. And whether that's a service like a recommendation or, uh, you know, in our case, we started a new category within an industry, unsweetened flavored water and the stuff, it just takes time. And, you know, you can't necessarily buy your way into getting the consumer to understand it either. It really is adaption. And so that was something that I think Jeff really, I mean, it was, absolutely nailed but it really is just another proof point of of kind of an entrepreneur that being ahead of your time is not necessarily fun i bet it was extremely lonely and and uh but you very clearly knew that he was on to something in 1996 yeah thank you for sharing that story it's yeah. kind of incredible in the sense that People who have this grand vision oftentimes see the top of the mountain. They don't know how to get there. And other people think they're probably crazy to want to go that direction. And I think both yourself and Jeff in very different ways have done that throughout your career. I think what Amazon's been able to accomplish over the last 30, 25 years is pretty incredible. I look at Whole Foods, right? We're talking about health conscious eating in general, whoever thought that Whole Foods and Amazon initially made a good decision, but uh, it's proven out to be quite effective. And I'm sure they're looking at other acquisitions or building things out that are going to be quite incredible. I think in general, that story about what you were able to do, again, in that conversation with Jeff, and just have this tenacity to go and say, yes, I can go build these bookshelves when I have no idea what I'm doing it's again, a testament to how you think and how you operate. And I know that's actually a lot of what you talk about in your book, Undaunted. And speaking of books, that's kind of where I want to transition now is really yeah. unpack what you talk about in the book, because I know a lot of people may have read it. A lot of people are definitely going to pick it up after listening to this, but I think you are genuine throughout the book where you, as you mentioned earlier, really talk about some of the challenges and the tribulations that happen throughout a person's life and your career in particular, what does being a doubter really mean to you? What does it mean to doubt? So I think as humans, we all have doubts, right? We all at, at some point, even the most confident people, uh, maybe they even have more doubts, right? You have fears. You, um, I think as you grow older too, and you become successful, you know, you go from manager to director, VP, CEO, whatever, you don't want to take steps back in order, you know, to fail, right? And, and, or to potentially fail, of course, you want to be successful, but you're not willing to take those risks. You're not willing to look stupid, foolish. You're not willing to be a student anymore, because, you know, you've grown up in some way. And, and I think for me, what I like to encourage people to do is that, is, is to really look at a life instead of being a lifelong learner and just keep putting yourself back into those early beginning stages because you not only grow and you, you, know, you don't have to go back to school in order to, uh, to grow, right? You can do that just by kind of forcing the issue in a career. I mean, I, I think people have said, well, do you have to quit your job and then just go and jump into another industry? No, not at all. I mean, I have a story in the book about 
a guy that had worked in finance in our company forever. And he, you know, ended up coming into, uh, he wanted to work on supply chain and operations. He had been seeing kind of what that world was about and how it, it intersected with what he knew in finance, but there were stuff, there was stuff that he didn't know until he, but he was kind of seeing little pieces of it. And so again, he went back to being a superstar finance person to all of a sudden jumping in, you know, going to bottling plants and really understanding how trucking companies come into place, how, you know, caps, how those, you know, come into play and times and, and how do you add all those things? Very uh, analytical in many ways, but he didn't have to put himself into a position where he was going back down to the bottom and being a student yet he was a quick study and now he's running our, you know, supply chain and operations. So you can do it inside of companies. I think that are oftentimes not large companies probably, um, but smaller entrepreneurial Silicon Valley companies for sure, where you jump in and, you know, you're curious, all of those are traits. They're not necessarily, they don't define you, uh, or I should say your, your experience shouldn't define you that the, the traits should be the things that are really defining you your you know curiosity your uh your ability to get back up again and try again um your uh your ability to look backwards and actually see those challenging times when maybe you felt like gosh i'm a failure i can't get it done and then you're like well I actually did get it done. It went a little bit different way, but here's how I was able to do that. Because if you can actually be that person that is a critical thinker, uh, that is trying to uh, solve problems in a way uh, that, that, that maybe no one else has done before, that's living undaunted. And that is not, it's not common. Um, for any age, any gender, right? It's, it really is not the way uh, we're comfortable in, in living. And so I think that there are definitely examples of people who have done it. I think Jeff, Jeff Bezos is undaunted. Um, I think they tend to also be a little bit scrappy. They, they don't tend to you know, be afraid to build a bookshelf. I bet Jeff Bezos would still build a bookshelf even though he's buying a you know, $500 million yacht, right? Like I, I bet he still would, right? And it's just, he doesn't have to, but he's willing to do it. Um, you know, I think that that is, those are the people that want to live undaunted because they are choosing this, this path versus the path that is easy. So to take that even further, if you're looking at today's world and hiring and how would you recommend people bifurcate a lot of the noise that exists out there that you have to follow the stereotypical model in the corporate workspace, climb up a ladder versus giving yourself permission to make pivots or adjust or to learn new things? And how do you seek out those types of companies or managers or individuals who are really going to lift you up? Yeah, I think it's, uh, look, it's it, I think it's really easy if you're willing to go into an early stage startup because it's kind of all hands on deck, right? You've got, everybody's doing a little bit of everything and, you know, oftentimes you're in one room and you can kind of hear what's going on and hear how you might be able uh, to be helpful. But even as, you know, the different stages in the company's development, you start to see how, these roles really, you know, intersect and how, um, again, just being able to jump into those, those different areas, you can actually add value in, in some way. And I think, again, just leading with your own curiosity and, and trying to help out, that's where you start to learn about these different roles. Um, you know, there's definitely these larger companies that are a little more defined that where I think it is harder to go and do that. So again, it's the advantage of being able to, the first step I think is to take that risk and actually say, I'm going to go to, you know, maybe not a startup, but a, you know, series A or series B startup that is a little, and I, and here's what I want to do. I can come in and I can, I can do that finance job, but I understand how these two things inter intersect and that's what I really wanna do. And 
I think people need that kind of talent and mindset, because again, I think if they're, you know, if they want to be better and they don't want just to have kind of a typical, um, you know, person in, in any role, which I don't think most companies in Silicon Valley and lots of different industries want, you want people who are smart and who want to improve things in some way. So I think it's just, I think it's asking and also telling people what you want right along the way too. Cause that, I think that's another thing that waiting for it, you are, you control your destiny, right? And if you don't believe you control your destiny, then you don't. Exactly. Right? I mean, it's just, and so if you actually go into companies talking about this is what I've done, this is how I, this is what I want to do. And, you know, start to network around too. I think that that's the other thing that just because you're looking for a job doesn't mean that, you know, maybe people haven't even thought about that too, right? Maybe you can solve a problem for people on how these two roles intersect in some way. So I think that's, that's really the key thing, but really actually owning what you want to do and how those things intersect. I remember, I know your background is in engineering. I, we had an intern uh, a couple summers ago and he was giving me a ride home. Uh, one day he lives in Marin County where I am too. And he was giving me a ride home and we were talking and uh, he said, you know, it was really interesting. I got to spend time with the customer service team. And I said, huh, like, what were you doing? I mean, he's coding, you know, during the day and he's, and I said, what were you doing on the customer service team? And he said, well, my desk was actually by the customer service group. And I started to hear about some of the challenges that they were having. And I was curious if it was something in the website that was a navigation of some sort that we should look at to see if we hadn't really thought about it. So I asked if I could actually get on the phone with some of these, uh, some of the, you know, concerns. And, uh, and so what I found was that if I actually spent an hour on the phone through my internship, um, I'm coding for the rest of the time and working with the group there, but then actually spend the time on the, uh, on the customer service, I was actually hearing what the challenges were. And then I brought that information back to the e-commerce team they hadn't thought about the things. And so he actually came in and solved a problem for the e-commerce team, an intern, right? Who was curious, who said, would you mind if I spend time on design, right? On design thinking. And again, like we, we weren't even going to ask him because we had defined as a company, we had defined, okay, you're an engineer, you're going to do this. But he went out of his way to try and figure out how can I actually solve a problem? But also, I mean, he differentiated himself by actually doing something that was like, wait, we haven't had anybody else ask, you know, to do this. Of course you can cop in on customer service stuff. So again, I, I really think it starts with you and actually telling people what you're curious about, um, but also just, just asking and showing up and offering. Exactly. I think, first of all, that story is just so powerful and it demonstrates that you just have to identify any problem. And at the end of the day, there's always some level of a solution, but the curiosity and that combination is really that key to success. And that's the theme that I'm hearing from you right now. I know oftentimes, especially a lot of our listeners end up being kind of early stage founders who are curious around how do I actually start a company, maybe while I'm working, but also just fully take the plunge. And I know that starting Hint was, let's call it an accidental success, but you worked really hard and you committed to that level of curiosity. But I know that starting a company is never easy. There's always a lot of challenges that happen. I'm curious, what was one of those moments early on where you had to maybe doubt yourself and question whether this was truly going to work? So it was probably a year into starting Hint where I was, I was really up against the wall. I, I could not figure out how to, Whole Foods was asking us 
for a longer shelf life on the product um, than we had figured out how to do. And I also wanted to uh, find some more bottlers to produce our product without preservatives in it. Um, Whole Foods was also sharing, and they were our primary partner in the, in the early days in San Francisco. They were talking about distributing across the US, but we had to kind of figure out how to put that network together. And again, I'm in tech. I had no idea. I'm like, hey, do you have Cisco's phone number? I mean, I had no idea how to actually get started. And they said, no, you're on your own. You have to go figure this stuff out. And I was just really stuck. And that's when I was sharing with a friend that I had four kids under the age of six Plus, I'm trying to, you know, figure out this new industry. I was tired. I was just really challenged. And that's when sharing this with my friend, uh, she said, you know, I was sitting on a plane next to this very senior guy from Coca-Cola and I should reach out to him because I don't know, maybe he can bottle your product. Maybe I don't know, distribute whatever it'd be. I'm like, that'd be great. I'd love to talk to him. That was, I remember thinking that, you know, here's this very senior person in a multi-billion dollar company. He's going to wave his magic wand and solve all my problems and everything's going to be great. Great connection, right? So I get on the phone with them and we're having our meeting by phone and about 15 minutes into the, me describing and really selling him on how great it is and how people are loving it. And we're only a few stores, but it's great. Uh, he said, sweetie, Americans love sweet. This isn't going anywhere. And I was like, wait, what? He just called me sweetie. I'd never been called sweetie before in my life. And very, you know, whatever, condescending. You, uh, it, uh, there were a lot of things going through my head. But it's funny because people have said to me, why didn't you straighten him out? Why didn't you hang up the phone on him? I, I have no idea. I think I was just in so much shock that I just sort of sat there and I thought, huh, this is kind of bizarre. And when I tuned back in, what I realized is that he continued to talk about what he believed was what the consumer wanted. And what he believed that the consumer wanted was zero calories. So at the time, diet soda was about 10 calories and they hadn't perfected the zero calorie thing. And so he was going on and on about the consumer just wants zero calories and they want it sweeter. And I'm thinking, but what about me? I've experienced this firsthand and I may want that, but eventually I'll wake up and figure out that that's actually not getting me health. And that was the whole reason why I was drinking diet and over these other drinks anyway. And so at the end, I think he thought he convinced me that I wasn't I should just shut the company down. He was like, not going to go anywhere. You should go back to tech. This is a terrible idea, whatever. And I really felt like I was talking to somebody who was on a, a different trip than I was, a different river. Prior to this call, I had ne I had really, I had looked up to him. He was godlike because he was this multi-billion dollar company, right? And, and I wanted him to solve all my problems. It was so crystal clear to me after that hour that he didn't know how to produce a product that didn't have preservatives in it. He did not see the same consumer that I saw that frankly, I was hearing back from over the last year who was saying things like, you're helping me control my type two diabetes, which was the first time I ever heard about this disease. About 2% of the population back 16 years ago had type two diabetes, today 40 to 45% have have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. And so it was it was clear that what I was doing was trying to help people get healthy. What they were doing was trying to sell product. And and that was no one could have told me that. I had to experience that and I thought why do I listen to somebody and why do I care? Why I mean even the sweetie part of it. I thought he, he's talking about something else. I need to focus on what I'm doing and either quit or throw the gas on because he has a lot more money than I do. And if I try and convince him and share exactly who this consumer really is, 
he's got a cruise ship that, you know, he's, it's going to take him a while to turn around, but he can do it. And I need to just instead get going and really build out this thing. And so that's what I did. And it was very, it was very motivating actually in some bizarre, like weird way, because when you have those moments and again, like you don't know when you're going to find them, right? It's the Jeff Bezos story. It's like, you just kind of show up and you think, okay, yeah, it sounds good. But then all of a sudden it turns into a very, very different situation than you thought, but always I learn, I stop and I really think, and I learn along the way, you know, what am I supposed to be picking up? And, you know, it's probably, uh, probably, you know, more far out maybe than some people want to go, but I, I just totally believe that these pieces are put in your journey for you to actually be better as Absolutely. a human. I think that story in itself just highlights what being undaunted means. Uh, it's just a characteristic that you clearly have had within your DNA for so long. And I'm personally extremely happy that you didn't listen to him because one, I selfishly love Hint Water, so I'm glad we're having this conversation. But the reality is, is most consumers in America and especially internationally just fundamentally don't understand that these consumer brands that are high on sugar are built in an intentional way to keep you addicted to them. And unfortunately, they have a copious amounts of different effects on your body, especially long term. And I'm sure different people have experienced this and know the effects of it. And it's painful. So there's plenty of alternatives out there. I think Hint and everything that you stand for and have built is pretty remarkable to say that. And I just commend you for doing that and for writing your book and sharing your journey because again, there's a million pathways we can take. And although we can get advice from either yourself or myself, at the end of the day, it's your own journey and you have to follow and you have to figure out what's best for you. So I appreciate everything you shared, Kara. What is the best way for most people to find you on the internet and connect with you? Yeah. Kara Golden with an I and, uh, and definitely, uh, if love for you to pick up a copy of my book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. And I also have a podcast as well, The Kara Golden Show, where I get people's great stories, founders and CEOs of companies that are, have really inspired me and helped me to learn um, along the way. So it, it's, uh, I think it, it, it's, for all of us, it's a journey about, you know, being, uh, being real and knowing that it's not always uh, a road of being a unicorn or being a failure. There's stuff that happens along the way. And it's really, how do you, uh, how do you keep going? How do you keep, how do you keep knocking those walls down? How do you learn from your challenging times that allow you to, you know, just be better? Thanks so much, Kara. We're definitely going to share everything in the show notes so people can find you on the internet. Definitely check out Undaunted and uh, Dry Hint Water if you haven't. But Kara, we always have to put all of our guests through the hot seat before we let them off the hook. So I just want to ask, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. So I think I have to be fair with you and ask a simple kind of layup type question. What is your favorite uh, flavor of Hint Water? Well, since I have two of them here, I would say it's cherry and I have all flavors in my uh, fridge, but I always tend to uh, be on autopilot to, to grab the cherry, but I am still developing uh, all the different flavors. And so it's, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't develop a flavor that I, that I didn't love that I would say second, that is, uh, that is. Uh, we call it a smash up. So it's not always at, out. We sell it on our website at drinkhint.com is blueberry lemon. So good. Love it. Uh, perfect. Next question for you. So hint is growing, expanding, and there's so many incredible opportunities. Let's just say you had an opportunity to start a brand new company today. What would the industry be and why? <sighs> You know, I think I'd be industry agnostic about it. I think it's, it really, so 50% of our business, almost 50% of our business is direct to consumer, which is uh, really surprising to a lot of people because that's not really 
uh, the, the way that most beverage companies are built. They're built by being in, in grocery stores or in Costco or whatever. We're in that, but we also have this direct to consumer business. And again, I think for me, it's really thinking about the customer journey and about, uh, and about I, I think over the last year in particular, if anything great came out of this pandemic is that this consumer is more interested in figuring out how they get healthy and stay healthy. And it's, uh, and I think that that was not something that most people focused on um, prior to, you know, March in the U S of last year. So it would have to be something really focused on healthy consumer and how to actually help people. Awesome. One final question for you outside of your own book. And I ask this of everyone, if you had to read one book for the rest of time, what would that book be? For the rest of time, I have so many books here. Um, you know, I just read this book, actually. I just finished. Sorry, I have to go over here. And it was out a little while ago, but do you know Guy Kawasaki? Oh, yeah. Um, did you read Wise Guy? I have not yet. And it's, I mean, it's so good. On um, And I read it. I was on his podcast and, I, you know, I, I've known Guy for many, many years and I hadn't read it. And it's, I mean, he keeps reminding us that it's not his, you know, kind of uh, autobiography. It kind of is, but I mean, it's just really, really interesting and definitely his days at Apple, but also just kind of going against the grain and just doing at the, at the end of the day, what he wants to do. He sets little goals for himself and like, he has a lot of failures in there along the way um, that I would just really, really love. And, and I think it's, um, it's really, really inspiring. So I would say wise guy. Perfect. So make sure to grab a copy of Wise Guy and Undaunted. Kara, again, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and sharing so many incredible stories. Really appreciate it. And as we always say on the Career Meets World podcast, go unleash your wildest potential. Thank you so much. Thank you.